Welcome to Science Fiction 101, the podcast series where we look at science fiction from all the different angles you could possibly imagine, or something to that effect. I'm Phil. And I'm Colin. And today we're going to be looking at something to do with Star Wars. We're going to be looking at an unfilmed Star Wars script. It's something we've done before. We did it with Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but this time we're going to do it with The Empire Strikes Back. Before we go on to that, though, we have the usual comments on our last episode. Uh, Emmanuel said it was excellent. So thank you, Emmanuel. Say no more. Although he did offer me a new word, or at least a word that's new to me. I talked about counterfactual science fiction, um, which is sort of alternative history or alternate history. Uh, but he gives me a new word for that. Euchronia which I suppose is like utopia, but it's to do with time rather than space. Hmm. So thank you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel also agreed with me on the list of disappointing science fiction shows. Uh, he says, Discovery started beautifully and completely lost its way, and Westworld went from great to what the heck between seasons <laughs> one and two. And the only other show, he says, that manages that so beautifully is True Detective. Season one is terrific. Season two is barely watchable. Seth says, throwing in my two cents about Star Trek first seasons being rough, I agree with Phil. Well, everyone's agreeing with me today. This is brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Phil that uh, TOS was best in its first season. And for my money, Strange New Worlds had an absolutely terrific first season. It's almost an unfair comparison since Discovery Season 2 was almost Strange New Worlds Season 0 0.5. But it's still great. And uh, then I think Colin said, I've just read today that season one of New Strange New Worlds will be available to watch for free on YouTube. I'm going to check it out. Was that you, Colin? I think that was you. That was me. Yeah. There are not a lot of Collins in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe says the BSG, Battlestar Galactica, reboot was a great show for two plus seasons. And he says, I'm not sure what Colin's problem is. <laughs> But then he did put one of those little smiley faces with its tongue sticking out, so he's not entirely serious. But he says, I like the original Battlestar when it, when it aired, but seeing it rerun on the Sci-Fi channel in the early 90s, I realised it wasn't a great show. Andy said, great podcast again. I can't believe I missed Firefly off my list and Farscape. And uh, he praised the awesome quiz which came in from a listener. Joe also said, Colin talked about Deep Space Nine coming to him as opposed to the current streaming model where we have to seek out shows. And he points out 90s Trek was syndicated and the last season of DS9 and the second season of Voyager onwards were actually hard to watch in his area because of changing TV deals. So as much as I liked DS9, he says, I didn't see much of its final season when it aired. So, yeah, there are some problems with all methods of delivery. And I suppose we think streaming is close to the ideal because it's what we want when we want it. But of course, sometimes the thing you want to watch nowadays isn't on the streaming service you've got. So you, you either have to subscribe to more than one or cancel one and subscribe to another if you haven't got the money for both or resort to um, under-the-counter methods of obtaining your programmes. So thanks for those comments, folks. Uh, it's always great to see the conversation continuing beyond the episodes. And I have a feeling today's episode might generate some comments, particularly if we have some Star Wars fans listening. And of course we do. Of course we do. Oh, yes. <laughs> So let's move on to today's topic, which is The Empire Strikes Back, or as it was written on the front page of the script, Star Wars Sequel. Colin, would you have gone to the cinema to see a film called Star Wars Sequel? Yes, I think so. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember being, you know, nine years old and having my parents come back from watching Star Wars in the theaters, which in my town was the drive-in theater. Uh -huh. 
and um, you know, trying to tell me about this incredible thing they saw. And my mom would sketch out <laughs> pictures of what a lightsaber was, and uh, you know, what the Millennium Falcon looked like, and an X-wing fighter. And so I actually saw the you know, this movie came out with another name called The Empire Strikes Back. I actually got to see it in the theaters. Hooray! <laughs> I don't think I've seen Empire in a cinema. Um, I've, I've had quite a patchy history with uh, Star Wars films. I've I think more often than not, I've seen them on TV first, but I've seen a couple of them in the cinema, probably three or four, actually, uh, in the cinema. What we should say about The Empire Strikes Back is that it was, well, from today's point of view, it's the inevitable sequel to Star Wars, which was a huge blockbuster movie. But this was in, in an era where there were no sequels. You know, it, generally speaking, if a film was a success, they would move on to making another film that was somewhat similar to the previous one. So if somebody makes a disaster movie and it's a big success, people would start making other disaster movies. It never really occurred to people to start making sequels until Star Wars. There, there are exceptions, of course. The Planet of the Apes films was a film followed by four sequels. But that was very much out of the ordinary to do that. And certainly in the mid-70s, nobody really was doing sequels. I suppose there was a Jaws 2 after the huge success of Jaws. And then when Star Wars was the biggest success of all, what else are you going to do but make a sequel to it? So George Lucas turns to seasoned science fiction writer and screenwriter Lee Brackett and asks her to write the script. And she turned the script in in February 1978. And then she died in March of 1978. She'd been ill for some time, but she managed to complete a draft of the script. In fact, it's not the first draft. It's uh, I think it's labelled as her third or fourth draft. But she wasn't around for the script to be developed any further. And so Lucas himself had a go at rewriting the script and then brought in Lawrence Kasdan. And uh, the resulting screen credit on the film is Lee Brackett and Lawrence Kasdan from a story by George Lucas. But what we're looking at today is Lee Brackett's script, the first attempt to write that sequel. We should perhaps warn listeners that we're going to inevitably do spoilers in this. We can't avoid doing spoilers. So if you've never seen The Empire Strikes Back and you're waiting to watch it, well, go and watch it first and then come back to us. It's probably appropriate to talk a little about Lee Brackett because I know people know George Lucas and Lawrence Kasdan and John Williams and Irvin Kirshner. Yeah. And our fans, I would hope they know about Lee Brackett because we're a science fiction podcast. Mm -hmm. But it isn't like they went down the street and just found any old person that happened to be around. <laughs> uh, Lee Brackett was the first ever woman to win a Hugo for Best Novel. Yeah. That was for her novel, uh, The Long Tomorrow in 1956. Right. With C.L. Moore, she was the first of two ever women nominated for a Hugo. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they lived in the L.A. area, which, a bit, which would have been very convenient for being a screenwriter. Yeah. And so they were part of the L.A. Science Fiction Society. And uh, when she got married to Edmund Hamilton, another science fiction author, Ray Bradbury was their best man. Yeah. <laughs> they were lifelong friends. And uh, I'm, Lee Brackett was something of a mentor to Bradbury in his early days. And uh, they were colleagues who helped each other finish their stories in, you know, in the 1940s. So, uh, yeah, they were they were very close. And she had a lot of screenwriting experience. Yes. Uh, the movies The Big Sleep, Rio Bravo, The Long Goodbye, not science fiction at all, but, you know, successful movies. And so they knew who they were picking when they did this. And it was a good choice. You ran through that list of films very quickly there. But The Big Sleep was a... Raymond Chandler story. Lee Brackett was experienced in writing crime fiction because as well as a science fiction writer, she was a crime writer. So she landed the job of writing that script. This was in 1946, I think. And if you look at the credits on that film, she's not the only screenwriter credited. The other screen, the other writer credited is William Faulkner, who oh. of course is a, a Nobel Prize winning novelist. <laughs> So she was really top flight in in screenwriting terms. 
um, and worked with all, all the major directors for a good many decades. And of course, this script was her last, as far as as far as I know, at least, because she died just a month after handing it in. Colin, what did you? What was your overall impression of it as a as a script or as a film? If you'd seen that script filmed, what do you think your reaction to it would have been? Would you have been pleased with it? I I'm not sure. It's mm-hmm. not bad at all, mm-hmm. but it's significantly different in a lot of ways. And it uh, it kind of bolsters this idea that you know, Lucas did not have you know a, a complete nine movie overarching plan for everything down to yeah. the finest details, yeah. because there are some very important details that are significantly different between <laughs> this screenplay and and the movie. Now I wonder, the movie that we got to watch had the benefit of having revisions after it was written with Lucas and the you know and, and the director Irvin Kirshner. And having being edited. And so it's hard to tell, you know, if what, what we read would truly have been on the screen verbatim. In fact, yeah, probably not. Yeah, true, true. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it would have been good. I just don't know. I don't know how good. Some people talk about the final draft of a script really being the final cut of the film because the narrative can change completely. I do apologize for that loud noise that you may be able to hear. That's a motorbike outside my house on a very hot day. I can't close the windows, so we're stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> Much of what we know of The Empire Strikes Back is there. Uh, the key characters, the key beats, the key shifts of story, the mm-hmm. kind of parallel storytelling in that we, uh, fairly early on in the script, we separate Luke from the other characters, Han and Princess Leia and so on. And they they go off and have their separate adventures and then converge again towards the end of the film. So that's in the film. That's in Lee Brackett's script. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there was anything in it that made me go, aha, what a great moment. I'm a, I'm hampered by a couple of things. One is apparently I, I don't read comedy. So as I was reading the script, I kind of realized this is missing all the humor and the, you know, the, the jabs and the puns from the movie. And I realized, no, they're actually there. I'm just not picking them up for some reason. Yes. Yes. And the other thing is as a musician, I love classical music and I own the remastered version of this movie's soundtrack. As I was reading the script, anytime the plot lines (laughs) in that script and the movie lined up, my brain would helpfully start playing the segment of the soundtrack that matched this. (laughs) Oh, that's brilliant. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it must be my canonicity detector. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but after I read the bracket script, I watched the film. And the the thing that really stuck out for me is the music. For you, it worked the other way. You read the script and it evoked the music into your head. For me, I read the script without hearing any music at all. But then when I watched the film, and obviously every time Darth Vader's in a scene, you get the Darth Vader theme striking up. And it just, all the music felt extremely corny to me because it was so underlining. It was like um, the director taken a highlighter pen and highlighted the entire scene saying right this is Darth Vader so he's got a, one of those fluorescent yellow highlighters and <laughs> yeah. struck that across the scene and it's come out as music you know shall we just say in brief that the plot is more or less the same between the script and the film and then we can talk about some details would that be fair? oh definitely yeah. yeah so let's talk about some of the details then the the first detail that struck me as being off in some way, is there's a character called Minch. (laughs) (laughs) Now, if you come to the script without warning and there's a Minch character, if you've never seen the film, it won't suggest anything to you. After a while, you might suddenly realise, hang on a minute, that's Yoda. (laughs) So Yoda was originally called Minch. And I've seen various articles that say that uh, Lucas referred to the character as Minch Yoda, but he obviously didn't tell Lee Brackett that because she just calls the character Minch throughout. And I don't think there's anything in the description to indicate that it's a small creature of Muppet-like proportions. I want to say he was mentioned as being frog-like at one point. Oh, yeah, I think he was. You're right. When Luke meets him, he's he looks down at him and he says, it's wizened, frog-like, totally unhuman... 
Uh, and here's this thing. We're actually reading a, a version of the script with things that are struck out, overwritten, with all kinds of notes. Oh, yeah. So then comes, with bright, intent eyes that show a curious mixture of intelligence and what could be madness. Right. And I suppose, yeah, if you know Yoda, I suppose that does describe the Yoda that we know. But it's hard to imagine that what Lee Brackett pictured in her mind was Yoda as we know Yoda. And certainly the speech pattern that we're used to, that kind of reversing of sentences that uh, Yoda characteristically does. Minch yes. doesn't do that. So that clearly wasn't thought of until later on. What did you think of C-3PO and R2-D2? It seemed to me that Lee Brackett really did capture those two characters remarkably well. Yeah, R2, well, R2 doesn't have that much character aside from his actions and his, you know, his sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did notice that some of his scenes were verbatim between the script and the movie, particularly oh, really? the one where he falls in the water off of the spaceship and then kind of zooms around with his periscope poking out. Oh, yes. C-3PO, you know, is such a comic foil every time he's there. The C-3PO in this script is a little wiser, a little mm -hmm. more... Uh, sensitive to humans that I think than the C-3PO we're used to in the movies. Yeah, but he certainly has lots of mishaps, doesn't he? Because he gets turned into a, a block of ice fairly yeah, early yes. on in the film. <laughs> Which, of course, in the, in the Empire Strikes Back, they, they freeze Han Solo much further on in the story. Uh, they, that sort of, what do they call it? Car not carbonized, car carbonated. I can't remember what they called it now. Um but they the tested carbon it. freezing, yeah. Yeah, they tested out the method of freezing on him before doing it on Luke, or before the intention of doing it on Luke. But in Lee Brackett's script, that doesn't happen, as far as I recall. But you do have a scene very early on in the film where um, C-3PO gets... He says he, he's turned into an icicle, basically. <laughs> yeah, and, and then and later on, he, he gets dismantled, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. which does carry over into the film. Oh, and an interesting side note about Carbonite. Yeah. Uh, Dave Filoni made an episode in Star Wars The Clone Wars that kind of retconned that Darth Vader knew that carbon freezing would work because he actually carbon froze himself and a team of clone troopers to infiltrate a prison at one point. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this, it, it was a retcon. And so you, you can kind of say, well, yes, he knew this would work when transporting Han Solo to the bounty hunters in Jabba the Hutt. Ah, fantastic. Something else I, I thought Lee Brackett was very good at in this script is describing or detailing the visual side of things. Uh, she doesn't use flowery language. She uses very straightforward, clear, simple sentences. So you very quickly get a mental picture of, for example, the ice planet at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I came away with a much more vivid picture of the, the sort of the base, the rebel base on the ice planet because of the way she describes it almost as being a fortress. And I, I don't, I can't remember whether she actually refers to the sort of castellations and, and turrets that you would get on a on a castle or whether that's a, something that was implied in her description that conjured up that image for me but generally I, I felt her planets were very convincing places so there's the ice planet there's the bog planet which is where Yoda uh, sorry Minch lives mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, what else is there oh there's the, the cloud city of course and all of those felt quite real and so clearly this was a, a science fiction writer uh, in her element in writing this script but I, I thought she was quite good at dialogue as well and I thought that the voices of Han and C-3PO and R2-D2 R2 they all sounded right they all spoke the right kind of language yeah they sound like the characters that we're used to from many many movies yeah yeah even though we'd only seen one movie at the time uh, that this one was done now, I wanted to ask you some questions about script writing. Mm. So you mentioned that the language was very clear and very plain, but but it's descriptive. Do script writers know how much of what they use is going to influence uh, special effects, costume design, set design? Or do they pull those things out and give more creative leeway to those designers? 
It varies from writer to writer, really. I mean, the advice that we give, because I, I teach screenwriting, as you know, mm -hmm. um, the advice we generally give is don't be too specific about describing things because there may be all sorts of reasons why uh, things cannot be shot the way you've described them. So um, e even something s as simple as saying that somebody has blonde hair, for instance, or red hair, it will come up at some point in a production meeting. Does it need to be blonde? Does it need to be red? That may limit the casting, you know. And if right. there's a good reason, you know, if there's a dramatic reason that a thing has to be a certain way, then it may survive. But a lot of things will be changed regardless of, of how well they're described in the script. So the general advice to a screenwriter is don't invest too much time and energy in putting in those details because they will be taken out at some point. The exception, though, can be that there is an opportunity for the screenwriter to be persuasive and have a strong influence on a film uh, through those kind of descriptions. So I, if somebody's good at writing in that way, I would never discourage them, you know. But I, it, you have to be prepared to be... Um, rewritten at some point so don't have any sacred cows in yeah, your script so it. to say that's yeah it. yeah one of the things i i loved about reading this script is that the version we were looking at has hand corrections on it which we assume are lee brackett's own corrections i'm i'm 99 certain that they are mm -hmm. um but it's great to see where she's crossed sometimes she's crossed out an entire paragraph and replaced it with like three words and other times you can see she's moved a piece of text from one place to another and as as somebody who's studied scripts in archives for a number of years now uh, i find that fascinating because it it starts to give you an insight into what's in the mind of the writer you don't always know why they've moved a thing they might have moved it because the producer said oh could you move that to a later point mm. other times it's because they've had second thoughts about where you know the order that things should go in so i i really liked um reading it in this form but uh, I appreciate some people will, will struggle because it's a bad quality photocopy that we're looking at. And it's important to remember that at this time, it would be impossible to have a pristine copy oh, yeah. because the, <laughs> the copy that we saw with the hand notes is probably the only copy because there were no computers back then. Yes, that's right. So this, this is clearly written on a typewriter. So, um, I mean, we're talking about 1977, 78. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were computers in the world, but most writers didn't write on a computer in those days. So Lee Brackett is clearly writing on a manual typewriter. And the reason I say manual is there are many instances where she's sort of I, I can't remember what the terminology is anymore, but she sort of rewound the position of the uh, um, the page and oh. <laughs> X'd out a whole lines of, of text. If you're on an electric typewriter, you could have a correcting facility. But this clearly, to me, is a manual typewriter. And if you, did you notice that there were some inserts where she'd had to squeeze a word in and the only way to do it is to sort of turn the page slightly and and type again over the top of an existing line of text, sort of squeeze in an extra line. So it's quite a, a balancing act to try and get all those words in there. Yeah, well, and I, I used to learn, I learned how to type on a manual typewriter. Mm. Um, my mom is a genius about convincing people to do things that are you know, difficult or challenging or, or onerous. She had my sisters and I fighting over who would be the person to run the cherry pitter when we would can cherries every year. <laughs> um, so I don't remember how she convinced me to learn manual typing, but it's been a, a skill that has you know, suited me well for a long time. But yeah, so in mm. the idea that you would remove the paper, give it a half, a half click, and then come back and try and type over that, that's, <laughs> that's evidence of someone that knows how to do what they do very well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, in terms of the, the practices in those days, I think what would happen is that the writer would uh, 
sit and type and then they would make their corrections and then they would typically hand the script over to the studio and then a typist would retype the entire thing so they would take the handwritten notes and insert them as typewritten so you know it would be properly formatted and by that time i'm sure they would have been using electric typewriters to do those studio versions of the script but this has all the hallmarks of being from the personal typewriter of the writer. Yeah. I don't know if you notice this, but as you get towards the end of the script and the pace picks up and we sort of accelerate towards the ending, there are a lot more typos uh, or a lot more uncorrected typos. And I can kind of imagine Lee Brackett sitting at the typewriter typing frenziedly as she gets really into the action of the story and not yeah. stopping to correct mistakes. And then to see minute examples of her corrections. So, And I've just made note of two of them here. They're just sort of randomly chosen, really. There's one bit in the script where she has originally typed this. The blast doors, they buckle, crumple, and go flying out into the sky. And she's gone in there and crossed out into the sky and just changed it. So it now says, they buckle, crumple, and go flying outward. And that's such a simple change. And it doesn't change the meaning, but it shortens the sentence, it simplifies the sentence, and it conveys the idea much more quickly. And that seems to me that that's what she's really good at uh, in her corrections. And there's an another one in a line of dialogue um, where Luke is talking to R2 and he says, as typed, he says, wait, little friend, it's a long search. And she's gone in there, crossed out wait and written in patience so that the line becomes patience, little friend, it's a long search. And again, the difference in meaning between wait and patience is a change of one word but it, it changes the entire reason for the waiting. Because to wait is just to wait. But patience is to wait in a particular way, in a patient mm -hmm. way. So just one word. And I love that when an author or a screenwriter uh, is able to tightly control the meaning through a judicious choice of words. It's that great polish. Yeah. There's a scene when Darth Vader is talking... And kind of giving us a little bit of backstory, because at the end of Star Wars, he is spinning uncontrollably out in space. Oh, yes. <laughs> having been run into by a TIE fighter that was shot by Han Solo. Yep. And so in this movie, it seems like there's a need to, to build some continuity and connection back to Star Wars. And it mentions that he wants to find Luke because Luke shot him and caused him to go spinning off into outer space. Hmm. And then there's a correction that says, no, that was Han Solo. Oh, Yes. Yes, because Luke was busy, busily bombing the um, Death Star, and it's was it the Millennium Falcon that comes in and causes um, Vader to go off into space? Is that how it happened? That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it makes me wonder: Had she seen the movie? Was she working off an <laughs> earlier draft of George Lucas's notes? Oh my! Or yeah. it's a significant plot detail. One, it's good that she caught it, but two, it makes me wonder about the whole inception of what caused it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if maybe she'd just seen the film once, that maybe they screened it for her so that she would understand it, uh, and she just misremembered one of the details or or blinked and missed it. But yeah, it's it's curious, isn't it? Yeah, oh, and it's not like she could have casually gone down to the store and picked up a copy to watch. That's right. Yeah, we we forget this. I mean, you you would assume if you were doing this today, you'd just rewind. If you thought you'd missed a bit, <laughs> or just press rewind, or just go back 20 seconds. But she couldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I felt around about the middle of the script that there wasn't very much urgency in what was going on. We had Luke off on the bog planet. I don't think he's gone there specifically to learn from Minch, but while he's there, Minch has come along and started teaching him. Yes. So he didn't feel that there was a lot of urgency that he needed to learn stuff in order to go and do whatever he was going to do. And nor did there seem much urgency about what Han and Leah were doing because they were supposedly going off to see a character whose name I'm going to mangle, but it's something like Ovan Marical. But there didn't seem to be any urgency about that. It's just, oh, we go, we'll go and see him. It wasn't, oh, we must go and see him because of some life and death situation. 
And so at the middle of the film, it just seemed to me, oh, sorry, the middle of the script, it seemed that there was there was no urgency and everything was just sort of plodding along. Yeah, we're doing some world building. Um Luke is yeah. out to be trained as a Jedi, and that whole revelation that Yoda is the Jedi Master, or Minch is the Jedi Master, is longer in the screenplay yeah. uh, than it is in the movie. It's In the movie, he kind of gets it later that day when they have dinner. Yeah. I get the feeling that he'd been with Minch a while, and Minch was kind of you know in the background watching him and instructing him. And, yes. And then for Han and Leia... They've just escaped the Empire. The Millennium Falcon is broken, so they go to Cloud City to get it repaired. And so they're just kind of hanging around waiting for repairs. Mm. And in the script, they've just escaped the asteroids, and they need to find a place to try and get Leia to be safe before Han Solo can go on with his mission to go to his kind of stepfather. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's this whole... well. What's going on? And what's going on is Darth Vader is holding them covertly to draw Luke out in both scenarios. Yes, but it just didn't feel very urgent in the script. I think it does in the film. I think there, is all, there are all sorts of things that have really tightened the tension um, by that point in the film. But I don't think lee brackets quite managed to do that in this version of the script that's not to say that she wouldn't have done had she been able to do further development on the script because of course we 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 must never assume that just because somebody's typed the end that that's the end of their script a script is a living document and after you've written it you then go into all sorts of discussions with directors and producers on refining it and making it work better What's your take on what happens to Darth Vader? Because as I read it, we've got Luke escaping from him. Vader sort of looks down where Luke has gone, and then we never see Darth Vader again. Yeah. <laughs> so it's almost as if, oh, was it that important then? Because, of course, in the, in the film, uh, it's vitally important that Vader tracks down Luke. And obviously we get the big revelation that Darth Vader is his father. But that isn't in Lee Brackett's script, is it? This is one of the big spoilers here. <laughs> it is. And it, in fact, we meet Luke's father. Yes. <laughs> well, Luke's father's force ghost, so to say. Yes. Yeah. And this is this is what you referred to earlier, I think, that we've, we've been given this mythology that George Lucas had the whole of Star Wars mapped out before he even made the first film. And so he knew all of them, all of the major moves of all these characters. Now, it's nice to think that he did, but it seems very clear to me that Lee Brackett did not know that Darth Vader is Luke's father. It, it, absolutely, Darth Vader cannot be Luke's father in Lee Brackett's script. And that being the case, that means George Lucas never told her. And therefore, I think... He didn't know either. I think he only figured that out later. Yeah. And if you think about it, if this movie had been filmed, the sequel movies, starting with J.J. Abrams and then Ryan Johnson and then back to J.J. Abrams, yeah. that really could not have occurred. That's right. Or, or if it did, it would obviously have to have a completely different set of stories going on there. Yeah. Now, I watched an interview with Larry Kasdan, who is the writer who came in after Lee Brackett. And his script the, is what we actually see. So when we're watching The Empire Strikes Back, we've, we see the, the film from his script. And he says that he doesn't think he was ever given Lee Brackett's script. He only ever met with George Lucas. And he might have been given Lucas's drafts of the script. Because after Lee Brackett died, Lucas had a go himself at writing a new script. Mm -hmm. Anyway, however, however that came about, what Larry Kasdan says is when he, Kasdan, wrote the script, it also did not have Luke, I am your father in it. But after he turned in the draft, George Lucas told him something in confidence, which he was not to share with anyone else. And that is that Darth Vader is Luke's father. So he then wrote that scene 
or at least those lines for that scene, and they were kept separate from the main script. So everyone reading the script in 1979, whenever this was, uh-huh. was not seeing that Darth was Luke's father because they wanted it to be a surprise for the actors and for all of the production crew. And that's entirely plausible, and there is evidence for it as well because Lawrence Kasdan's handwritten script pages, he writes his scripts longhand, so his actual script pages still survive and they're included in this interview so you can see them. So I I do believe what he says... um, (laughs) But even he wasn't told that Darth Vader is Luke's father. But in Kasdan's script, it is possible for Darth to be Luke's father. I mean, yeah. when you're watching the film, you don't think, no, that's impossible. What it does, and this is one of the genius moments in the film, I think. The genius moment is when he says, I am your father, your first reaction is, no, that can't be true. But then you think, oh, my God. If it is true, then what? And you start questioning everything you've been told up to this point. And in particular, you start questioning, why did Ben Kenobi tell him some contradictory things about his father? So just like Luke, you begin to reevaluate everything that's gone before. And so that, to me, that's the genius moment of the film. But it's crazy that that came in more or less as an afterthought or an add-on. It makes me wonder if if Lee Brackett was in exactly the same position where she wasn't told this very important detail and wrote this draft of the script Mm. in an alternate universe where she didn't die of cancer. Maybe she would say, yeah, I turned in this great script with Lucas. (laughs) And then he told me that something that I had written into it where Luke gets to reconnect with his father was completely bunk because (laughs) his father was Darth Vader. Yeah. And then she has to go and rewrite a whole portion of her script to make it work. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Lee Brackett had a a nickname, a a title she had kind of been casually awarded. It it was Mm -hmm. the Queen of Space Opera. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And she was also known for kind of doing science fiction romances. And, And that is something about her script that I was particularly struck by. There is more drama between Han and Luke and Leia about trying to get Leia's affections. Yeah. Um, Han is very aggressive. Luke has a lot of self-doubt because he's still the kid. He's not the confident Jedi Knight that comes out of uh, Dagobah mm-hmm. at, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of that that plays up through the movie. And it influences the fight he has with Darth Vader, where he is tempted by the dark side and then steps away from it. Yeah. So in the bracket script, it's much more of a love triangle, isn't it? The, because Leia is... There are scenes that are specifically described as romantic scenes between Leia and Han, but there are also scenes where she is kissing Luke. I think she does it more than once. So it's much more of a of a sort of a conventional love triangle being set up in the bracket script. But in the finished film, I think Luke is more or less oblivious to Leia's affections, wouldn't you say? Uh... When he comes out of the back to tank, there's this, there's a little bit of that that love triangle that happens, mm. and to show up Han, Leah walks over and kisses Luke full on the mouth. Yeah, but that's a deliberate action on her part to kind of put Han in his place. Yeah, yeah, and that that's kind of the end of it. From there, there's mm. a little bit more of the love triangle which shows up uh, in uh, Return of the Jedi where. Han decides that because of this new relationship that Luke and Leia have, that maybe he's he's finally on the outs. Yeah. But it's just been re- revealed that they're related, and so she is free to love Han with all of her heart. Yes, that's right. <laughs> all, all of those sort of big revelations about who is whose father, who is whose sister, none of that really is in the Lee Brackett script. And it, therefore, it it makes me think either... Lucas withheld information from Lee Brackett, which is possible. But I think it's much more likely that he didn't know these things himself. He hadn't decided on them until much later on. That's my feeling. And no doubt we'll have some George Lucas fans who will write in and give us chapter and verse on why (laughs) that interpretation is not correct. And I'd love to hear it. You know, I'd love to, to hear an alternative take on it. But it seems to me... The, the, it's, it's Occam's razor, 
the explanation with the fewest assumptions would be George Lucas was making it up as he went along. <laughs> that seems far yeah. more simple to me. <laughs> Well, and he may have had a rough treatment of how he wanted the entire thing to go. But when it comes down to all the details that flesh it out and make it a great story yeah. instead of a five minute pitch. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. Back in 1997 on the Internet, the, na- the you know, very young Internet, mm. somebody researched all of the press conferences and interviews and they actually got access to tapes of script meetings Oh, wow. Uh, For the development of Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back and put forth this novella size research paper (laughs) saying (laughs) that very, very thing. And I wish I could find it, but I can't anymore. Ah, what a shame. I'm sure it's out there somewhere and I'm sure somebody will. Well, I hope somebody will let us know. Yeah. Occasionally, Lee Brackett slips up with the terminology. And and these these are probably just typos that she would immediately correct as soon as she'd seen that she'd made them. But mm-hmm. for example, there's there's one bit in the script where she says, "Luke dropped the bomb that blew up the Death World." <laughs> now, of course, it's the Death Star. But there there are a couple of those. It made me think maybe she has only seen the film once. But then there were other things where it felt to me that she was saying, "Look." I'm a science fiction writer. I know how this stuff goes. And I want to make sure George Lucas knows how this stuff goes. So, for example, page 102, she wrote, The cloudy planet casts a cone-shaped shadow thrown by its sun. The bright speck of Luke's spacer vanishes into it. Now, it's a very specific description. But she's absolutely right that when a star projects light onto a planet the shadow is a cone shape that's a very science fiction writer thing to have put in the script and there was there was something similar i forgot what it was but there was some somewhere she talks about an explosion and she says something like and of course it makes no sound being in the vacuum of space that's not those aren't the words she used but it was to that effect it's page 129 (laughs) 129 yeah, it's when the um the 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 empire's fighters are bombing the asteroid field trying to find Han and Leia. Yeah. It says methodically they fire and drop bombs, shining pellets that explode with considerable violence against the larger asteroids, silently of course. <laughs> That's it. And uh-huh. it seemed to me this is a science fiction writer who has seen Star Wars and doesn't like the way all the explosions go and the ship's making those banked turns in the vacuum of space <laughs> and she wants to correct it <laughs> on paper. I've probably mentioned this before, but uh, the author that wrote the Heir to the Empire series, Timothy Zahn, when he wrote the first book of that series, he put in a note about an etheric rudder. Oh, yes. Which, which allows ships to slew instead of make, you know, the, the regular kind of turns physics would demand. Yeah, yeah. I'll show that, George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Every year for the past two years, Star Wars and Lucas and Disney, really, have put out this series of, of anime shorts by people that reinterpret Star Wars in anime and now other uh, you know, genres of animation or filmmaking. And I would love to see some of the scenes from this script being published in that. Right, it's it's yeah. the whole, it's the alternate universe, you know, timeline of what would happen. Yeah. Especially scenes which are different. Yeah. You laud it as, yes, this was, you know, Lee Brackett's original vision for this. This is the one that we saw, but here's what we could have seen. That reminds me of something similar that I've seen uh, where, let me think what this was, with the original Planet of the Apes movie, the the very first script for that was written by Rod Serling of Twilight Zone fame. Oh. And although the, the beats of the story are very similar to what we see in the finished film, he actually based it on the original novel. So it's uh, it's got apes living in a city like our cities and driving cars and aircraft and planes and all that sort of thing. And a few years ago, there was a comic book that was put out that basically took Serling's script and visualised it. So you can see what that would have looked like if they'd filmed it the way he'd written it. So that those things are, are always quite interesting, sort of alternate histories, really, of how scripts may have turned out. Interesting. I've got one last observation, which is on the character of Lando, 
who, in the script, in the Lee Brackett script, I wasn't very convinced by the character of Lando because I couldn't quite get a handle on on what he was trying to do because it seemed that he was taking up different positions at different times. He was a very slippery kind of character. In the mm. end, he, it turns out he was he was doing a thing but without letting on that he was doing a thing and there was sort of reversals to his character. So, um, now, all of that is similar to what's in the finished film, but I think in the finished film it was a bit more believable. I, I, I didn't particularly like the character, but I could see that the character was at least redeemed in the film. In the script, I, I wasn't sure that he was totally redeemed. You're kind of left with he's a... Uh... Well, he's what he's what he calls Han Solo. He's he's a scoundrel. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and of course, he he changes his name, doesn't he? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, he goes from Lando Kadar, Baron Kadar, yeah. to Lando Calrissian. Yeah, very elegant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else you want to say on that, or shall we move on? It was a great read, and I had fun doing it. Yeah, I thought it was really fascinating as well, and I would have been very happy if they'd filmed it as written. Okay, are you ready for a quiz? Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've taken the lazy route this time, and I've taken the quiz from the internet. This is from a site called bigquizthing.com, and it's 50 Star Wars trivia questions. But I'm not going to do all 50. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just do about 10 or so, and I'll try and keep score. Some of these are deep trivia. Some of them are quite surface, but let's see how you get on with these. An easy one to begin with. In Star Wars, what do they call the invisible power that binds the galaxy together? That's the Force. It is the Force. Okay, next question. C-3PO is fluent in how many languages? Isn't that six million forms of communication? According to this, it's over 60 million. But I I fear you might be right. I don't know, because this doesn't give references, you see. Next question. Who killed... The four Jedi Masters, Sacy Tin, Mace Windu, Kit Fisto, and Agen Kolar. Uh, that would be Darth Sidious. Yes. Next question. What is the name of Yoda's home? I'm talking about the, the world he lives on. Dagobah. Correct. What is the name of General Grievous's flagship, which was not mentioned in the movie? Oh, it's, uh, it's one of those great... Uh, Darth names. It's like it's like the Destructor or the de is it the Devastator? No, it's the Invisible Hand. Oh, what I can't quite figure out is how they know the name of it if it's not mentioned. Probably either through the comics or through uh, Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Okay, okay. The the sequel weekly series that came out. Yeah. What is the name of the Wookiee's homeworld? Kashyyyk. Correct. What species stole the plans to the Death Star? The Bothans. Correct. Who built C-3PO? <laughs> that would be young Anakin Skywalker. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> what is the name of Boba Fett's ship? Now, that's an interesting question. Originally, it was called Slave One. Yes. Recently, there's been a big backlash against, you know, the word slavery or slave. And so it was uh, actually think, renamed something else that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Oh, wow. How old is, uh, oh, I should say spoilers. How old is Yoda when he dies? Oh, oh it's hundreds of years. It's, uh, <laughs> is he 800 years old? No, he's even older. He's 900 years old. Oh, my. <laughs> What is the nickname of the Wookiee bounty hunter, Snoova? Uh, uh, no, Kyrgyzstan is a country. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It says here, Mad Claw. That's what happens when you don't read enough Star Wars comics. Ah, okay. And we'll finish with uh, two questions that I think you will find quite easy. Who <laughs> is the young Jedi Knight who becomes Darth Vader? Anakin Skywalker. Correct. And the last one, who killed Han Solo? His son, Ben. Not Kylo Ren? Ben is Kylo Ren. <laughs> Very good. Sorry, that was another spoiler. You don't want to... <laughs> 
<laughs> Very good. I think you got nine there. I think that was out of 13. That's a Star Wars trivia quiz, and there's about another 40 of those. So that's from bigquizthing.com. So thanks to them. Now, shall we move on to past, present, and future? Yeah, let's do that. I have a, a past, present bridging item that I want Ooh. to bring up because it's, it's what we do in our podcast. Yeah. Yesterday, the New York Times published an article, and this is a quote from the article. Old magazines are cheap time machines, archaeologies of collective desire. Find a print issue, specialist or popular, preferably more than 20 years old, though 10 may do the trick, and read it from cover to cover. And it was an encouragement for people to remember where we've been and what we've done. And I think that's a great reason to read old science fiction. If you look at today's science fiction and old science fiction, they are dramatically different in some ways and comfortably familiar in others. Yeah. It was a nice acknowledgement that that's a good and fun thing to do. And of course, one of the things that's really interesting is the context. It's not just reading old old stories. It's seeing all of the stuff that surrounds the stories, the ads, the uh, letters to the editor, the editorials, the news columns, all of that sort of stuff. I've got a past item. I'm not quite sure what people will do with this information, but I just happened to notice yesterday that it's the 50th anniversary of the release of Battle for the Planet of the Apes, which is the last of the Apes movies. The reason that leapt out to me is because I saw it on first release. So <laughs> it makes me feel really old to think that it's one of the first films I remember seeing in a in cinema. And uh, so, yeah, I feel really old because of that. But I still think it holds up quite well. It's it's probably the, the fifth best of the five Apes movies. But it's still OK, and it's it's worth a look if you've never seen it. What about present? It's close to Father's Day, and, and being a father, I thought it would be great to share a dad joke that was somewhat <laughs> science fiction related. So okay. are you ready for this? Yes. Phil, did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? <laughs> no, I didn't. What about the restaurant on the moon? It has great food, but no atmosphere. Wow, 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 wow. Very good. <laughs> Um, I've got a present item at the time of recording, the 16th of June today. Mm -hmm. Star Trek Strange New Worlds has just begun, season two. I haven't seen it yet. So anyone who's getting withdrawal symptoms now that Picard has finished, there's something to replace it. And I still have not caught season one on YouTube yet, so I have been uh, doing other things. Ah, okay, yeah. Do you have any other present items? North of where I live... In Vancouver, Washington, there's a University of Washington satellite site, okay. and one of the professors hosts uh, a podcast series called Reimagined Radio, and on Monday, they're going to be broadcasting four short science fiction stories by an author named Jack J. Ward. Uh, if you're not in this area, and if you're listening to this, you're probably not or it's after the broadcast date, you can go to the link in the show notes and you can stream it and listen to the production. Fantastic. I'd love to hear that myself. My other present item is very topical for what we were talking about today. I just found an app today which uh, does this. And it does this. And this. <laughs> it's an R2-D2 app. It's got a number of preset buttons with different faces on them for different emotional states. And so you press a button and it'll make a sound. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, it's, back in the day, you would have to buy a specialized piece of hardware to do that and carry it around with you. I know. But now you can just put it on your phone. Absolutely. There's a web page that uh, talks about how the original sounds were made for R2-D2. So it's it's a very respectful app. You know, it. I mean, it, in a sense, it's just ripping off Star Wars. But it is very respectful of the, the hard work that went into creating those sounds in the first place. So anyway, it's called the R2-D2 Vocalizer. Um, so I'll put a link on our website. Any more present? Recently, Seth and I have come across something which reminds me of Fahrenheit 451. And it's this idea that uh, electronic media is not static. It can be changed and altered. This mm -hmm. has been something I've noticed for years because the covers of my ebooks will change. Yes. 
But for the first time, I've either noticed, or it's the first time that it happened, that I suspect the content of one of my eBooks has changed. <gasps> I bought a copy of the Silo Omnibus from Hugh Howey mm-hmm. to get ready to watch the series, which is coming out yeah. on Apple TV+. Plus, and I read it. And then Seth mentioned a scene that I did not remember from this section I had just read. And I went back and it was there. <laughs> and then I, so I told this to him. And so we're trying to hunt down a, a physical copy of the original book, Wool, to mm. see if these chapters that talk about Holston's wife, which come out in the series, if they were in the original book or not. It's therefore not something you could complain about because you're getting extra material. But obviously it changes the balance of what it is that you've read. How, how annoying that could be if you'd had to do uh, a, a review of the book or a book report. And then after you've written your book report, the book changes and your book report is no longer valid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and for years we've had novels and adaptations as movies and then novelizations. Yeah. And it yeah. almost seems like they, they've went right to the, maybe they went right to the novelization in this omnibus edition. But there's more research to know. And as I learn things, I'll, I'll share them. <laughs> Interesting. There might be innocent explanations. I mean, it may simply be that something was omitted in the editorial process, you know, that a, a passage got lost and somebody noticed and then they they corrected it because that happens from time to time. Um, let's move on to the future then. I've got a couple of future items. Uh, the first one, I don't know how to pronounce it because they don't say in the trailer, but there's a Pixar movie coming in 2024, which is pronounced either Elio or Elio. It's typical Pixar animated stuff. And the gist of it from the trailer is that aliens out there have received our messages, you know, like the the golden record that was sent off on the Voyager probes and the um, the metal plaque that was on the Pioneer probes. Well, the aliens have received these things and they want to contact us now and they uh, mistake this little kid for our world leader. (laughs) So they ask him his name and where he's from, and he says he's from uh, Earth. And then forever after, the aliens refer to it as uh, Earth. Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) So it looks looks quite good. It, It looks as if it's referencing, well, Contact, the movie, and Star Wars, inevitably, and possibly... E.T. as well. So it it looks as if it's very aware of what's gone before it, which is often the case with Pixar. And on another animated note, the uh, official trailer for the Babylon 5 animated movie, The Road Home, is now out. So you can see the style of the animation. You also get, obviously, a hint of what the story is about. Um, But I, I was a bit surprised by the style of it. I don't think it's quite as shall we say, lavish as I imagined. It's not really in the style of anime, but it's more to the anime end of the spectrum than the Pixar end of the spectrum. So I don't know quite what I was picturing. I think I was expecting the characters to look very much like the actual original TV characters, but they're not drawn to be that accurate. There's there's a resemblance, but they're not um, slavishly close to the actors. Yeah, yeah. I was interested to see the trailer. Uh, It seems like the multiverse is everywhere now. Yes, yeah. Uh, The new DC movie, The Flash, which came out, multiverse Mm -hmm. and time travel. Uh, The new Spider-Man movie, multiverse, but it was Uh multiverse in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, multiverse is the thing these days. Yeah. Except for the new Andy Ware movie project, Uh Project Hail Mary. I've heard that Ryan Gosling has been picked up to do the the role of Ryland Grace. Okay, that, that's that makes sense because he was Neil Armstrong, if you remember. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Any more future items? No, I'm good. Okay, shall we wrap it up there then? Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks for listening, folks. We're Phil Nichols and Colin Kusky. Our theme tune is from PurplePlanet.com. Check out our show notes at 101sf.blogspot.com, where you can also leave us a comment or drop a couple of quid in our tip jar we also accept dollars and don't forget to give us a nice five star review on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and we'll see you next time